recording? Are we ready? We're good. Yeah. We're good. Okay, cool. Uh, so today we are going to learn about communication with designers and maybe how we can improve that and get some good feedback. And uh, we have Nella Donato from Orieka to help us. So please welcome her. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Steve, for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here, and especially for the panel later. Um, so I'm a freelance brand designer, uh, but I started off as a web designer in a web development agency. So I have some experience both as an in-house designer, and as a freelance designer, as an, as an outsourced designer, all kinds of combination. And some of my experiences with that were great. Some of the experiences were not so great. And I hope to share today what I've learned during my career. And I have to warn you, I'm very opinionated. And not all of my colleagues are going to agree with me on everything, but that's what the panel is for. So keep your questions for later. Anyway, uh, when we talk about client feedback, uh, we usually you know, think of things like clients saying inane things like, make my logo bigger, or make it pop whatever that means, or we want our website to look like Apple, even though we don't have any photos like them, and we have three pages of text to fit on the home page, and we need to have these 17 banners visible at the same time, but you know, make it look fancy, because that's what we like. And this sounds like an exaggeration, uh, but I have to tell you that these are conversations that actually happen in real life. And in my early years as a designer, uh, a lot of the feedback that we've gotten from clients sounded like that. Because me and my colleagues and my boss were very bad at talking to clients and managing the entire client communication. Uh, fast forward several years later, uh, I really committed myself to learning how to communicate with people, including clients and colleagues. Uh, and sometimes project managers, and uh, the quality of the feedback that we started getting became higher and higher, and this resulted in better designs. Because when you get useful feedback, constructive feedback, this improves the quality of the final design. Uh, so the final design is always better than the first proposal. Whereas in our earlier experiences, sometimes the final design was objectively way more ugly uh, and less usable than the first proposal. So uh, why is feedback good? I mean, sounds like a stupid question, but the reason is because designers are humans. We have our own blind spots. We don't sometimes pay attention to every single detail. We just miss something, so it's always useful to have someone else, especially a non-designer, look at our work and tell us, okay, you missed a spot here, so we can fix that. Uh, but why does bad feedback happen? I have a theory. So here we have our little love triangle with people who are usually involved in a feedback session, the client, the designer, and the project manager. And each of these people, they have their own domains and their own responsibilities, uh, their zone of genius, so to speak. So the client's uh, responsibilities are to set the objectives and the constraints for the project. So this is what we want to achieve, uh, this, this is our intended audience, and this is how much money and time we are ready to invest in that. Uh, then the designer is the person who will uh, do research, on all of those problems that the client presented and try to find the best solution for them all. And sometimes the two of them work alone, which is the case uh, nowadays for me most of the time, but whenever you have a larger team where you have developers and marketers and designers and everyone working together, then you need to have a project manager to keep them all in check and make sure that everyone does what they're supposed to do on time and remove any friction and bottlenecks and waste that might slow the project down. And sometimes the person is not officially labeled as project manager, but just one person, maybe a lead developer or chief marketer, <laughs> steps in and takes on that role, for better or for worse. That's usually the case for small teams. So the problem comes up when 
these people are not in their zone of genius, but they try to do other people's work or they, they don't do their own work. So for example, a client might try to do the job of the designer and micromanage the creative team, or the designer may kind of shrink and just delegate some of their responsibilities to the project manager, and so you get a complete mess where people don't really know what they're supposed to be doing, and situations like that, uh, for example, when a project manager and the client have a meeting and the designer is not present, but they're discussing design. This is what actually happens in some of the companies where I've worked. And I feel very strongly about this. This should not happen. So you can't have a conversation about design without the designer being in the room. The same way you can't have a conversation about development without a developer in the room. You need some kind of a specialist who is going to make sure that what we're discussing in the meeting makes sense and that what everyone says is like is on track and that nobody makes a suggestion that is not viable. So you have to have a person who will speak for the designers in a meeting, always. And I mean uh, in the kickoff meeting, in any kind of uh, presentation and in any kind of feedback session, uh, you need to have a designer there. So one way to kind of prevent unnecessary feedback is to make sure that you have all the information in advance. Because what sometimes happens, if you don't have all the information you need, then mid-project you get a surprise, we didn't tell you about this, but this design also has to be doing this, this, and this. And that's just a waste of time, so make sure to uh, compile all the information you need in the beginning of the project. And how do we do that? Uh, one way you can have an in-person interview with the client and ask them the millions of questions. Or you can create a questionnaire uh, that you're going to send to them and that they then, then uh, complete on their own time and then send you the results back. Uh, and I believe that the designer is supposed to be formulating these questions because they are the ones who know what kind of information they need. And of course, help from other colleagues is always beneficial, but you as a designer know what you need. And so if you're the project manager, ask your designer what do they need. Make sure that their questions are included in whatever you send to these clients. Uh, if you are a project manager who is working with a less experienced designer, so they don't know this, uh, you can encourage them to ask more questions. To ask more questions in meetings and to follow up and to create these really long questionnaires uh, which ask for every detail that you can possibly think of. For example, if you're in a meeting, you can ask your designer, okay, um, do you have everything you need? Uh, is there anything else we should talk about before we wrap up the meeting? And check in with them when they're working. Like, uh, is everything going okay? Uh, are you missing something? Should we ask the client if, uh, to clarify or to give us more information? Just make them feel like it's okay to ask questions because that's a part of the designer's job is to ask many, many, many questions. Okay, so let's say that you have all the information you need and the designer has started their work and they have gone through their entire process and now we have some kind of first uh, proposal that we want to show to the client. Uh, this moment in the project is key because what happens now will determine the course of the project later on. If the client is uh, positively impacted by this first presentation, then they will be positive toward the end. But if they're disappointed in this first presentation, then they will kind of become grumpy and trust everyone a little less. So prepare for these presentations. I also think that the person who created the design is supposed to be presenting it and answering any questions because they are the only ones who are educated enough to answer the questions. They know what they did, you know, and a third person can't answer the questions for the designer. Uh, what I like to do and what I recommend designers to do uh, is to explain what they did in their proposal. Uh, so to explain what is happening in the design and how, what was their thought process, how they developed it, why they did certain things. 
Uh, an example for a brand design for, actually this is a logo proposal, I like to uh, describe a bit of uh, inspiration behind the idea and some associations that have led me to uh, choose a certain symbol or a color or a typography. And this really helps clients get what this is all about. And uh, this frames their critique better when you show them the why uh, and the how behind the what. How you want to do this is up to you. Uh, In-person presentation makes, makes the best impact. Uh, that just human psychology, we find uh, in-person contact more persuasive and closer and more pleasant. But if you want to do it through video or through written communication, you can do that as well. Just one thing I would like to point out is that if you're having in-person meetings, uh, you should allow the clients some time to think through and give you their feedback uh, after a couple of days, after the imp initial impressions have settled. Uh, because later they may, not, they may notice some things they haven't noticed in the first moment and uh, we need to see what happens with the design after it has you know, uh, marinated a bit. So when people get a chance to think about it and they write you their impressions or you call them up and then they tell you everything they think about it in person. Okay, so, and now we have our proposal, we have our presentation. How does the client know how to give us good feedback? They don't know, because it's not their job to know. We need to teach clients how to give useful feedback. And we can do that in several ways. I know two and I have used two that work pretty well. Uh, one of them is to ask them very specific questions. And these questions differ based on the project, so this you have to figure out your own questions. But in an example of a brand design, I like to ask my clients, so how do you think this logo represents your company values? Or how does this visual identity communicate or, and connect with your target audience? Like how well do you think it does this specific thing? Uh, so this kind of focuses them on what's important and they don't have to worry and think about like, what am I supposed to say? What am I supposed to ask? I don't even know what they're expecting of me. Like you tell them what you expect them to tell you. Uh, another thing you can do is to give written guidelines to the clients, how they should approach the feedback session. And I have something that I call a welcome guide. It's like a little PDF booklet that I send all my clients in the beginning of the project that describes all the details about my process, but it also includes several pages of feedback guidelines. And this is just an example. You don't have to read this because I'm gonna have a, a bigger version. Uh, this is a page with examples of good feedback and bad feedback and explanation what's wrong with it. Uh, because I think it's very important to give people specific examples so they know what you mean when you say something. Okay, uh, just a short version of my feedback guidelines. Uh, first, whoever can shoot down the project needs to be in the room when you're discussing the design. I often heard horror stories where the CEO of the company would completely ignore the project until the very end, and then they would pop in and tear it apart and just give completely new set of requirements, and the designer has to start over again. So you don't want that to happen. Uh, if on the client's side, the person you're working with is not in charge and can't make their own decisions without checking in with the CEO, you have to bring in the CEO. It doesn't matter that they're busy, you have to include them. Uh, be honest. Like clients are often, you know, worried that they're going to hurt our feelings. Uh, so make them feel like they can tell you anything. And if I did something wrong, if I missed the mark completely, I want to know about it right away. So we don't waste any more time. Then be specific. And what I mean by that is that. When someone says they don't like something, they need to explain why they don't like it, what's wrong with it. And when they use specific word, words, what do they mean by these words? Because misunderstandings happen all the time. Uh, like if I had a euro for every time when a client requested a simple design, 
and then later complain that it's too simple, like, I would be rich. So really, it, just make sure that the client clarifies what they mean. Don't take simple as an answer. Okay, put yourself in the shoes of your target audience. Everyone should do that, like, we should do that as designers, and the clients should do that too. Like, think who their target audience is and what they would think, how they would feel, what is important to them, what goals they want to achieve, and does it work for them? It's not just important that the client likes it. Focus on your business goals whenever you're asking for additional design features. Like, do you want this feature because it's trendy, because you've seen it at someone else's website, or because it affects your business goals? Like, if it doesn't affect your business goals, then this is not a feature we should be having. And lastly, let me do my job. Now, this is somewhere where uh, designers maybe disagree, but I, I'm of the, uh, in the think, what, what I want to say, uh, I'm, I'm in the school of thought, yeah, where people are like, designers do the design job and everyone else does their own job. So the designer, uh, what happens now? I pressed something maybe. Uh, like when you have a client who's trying to tell the designer, I want, I want to make this blue or I want to make this red or make this uh, letters bigger and the project manager chim chimes in with their own suggestions. Uh, that's not a constructive conversation. That's other people trying to be designers. What the clients and the project managers should do and are supposed to do are point out all the problems. Uh, like, okay, thank you. Uh, they should point out the problems like, okay, uh, we can't read those letters or this is not visible or not. So point out the problem but let the designer solve it because there are more than one way to solve a certain problem in design. So give the designer a bit of freedom to experiment to find what solution works best. Yeah, we were on point six, great. Uh, okay, so here are those examples that I've uh, mentioned earlier. First example, I don't like the colors. The problem, it's subjective and it's not specific. We don't know what's wrong with the colors and maybe it's just a client's personal opinion. A better example, these colors might clash with some work product photos. Here are a few so you can test for yourself. Okay, great, now we know what the problem is and we are closer to the solution because now we have some photos and we can choose colors that are harmonious with those colors. Great. Okay, next, I don't like the photo in the header. Again, it's whenever you have the word like, it signifies subjective opinion. It's not specific, we don't know what's wrong with it. And uh, whenever you have photos, the photos are supposed to relate to the target audience. So you should look at everything, every visual from their point of view. Again, there's no mention of the target audience here. Better feedback, I don't think the photo in the header would engage our clients because they associate themselves with their more hippie, nature-loving vibe and less with minimalist professional spaces. Okay, so we missed the mark on the target audience. They would prefer something more organic and they don't like minimalist and clean. Great, we need to find some photos that are communicating with our target audience. My wife doesn't like it. <laughs> Substitute wife with any family member or friend that isn't in the target audience. So again, specific, uh, not specific, subjective, not relating to target audience. Useful feedback would be, I showed the concept to a focus group of people in my target market and they didn't understand it very well. Okay, great. Whenever you have more than one person saying the same thing, that's a good thing to pay attention to. You are less likely to, likely to get these subjective opinions and we know what the problem is. They don't get it. We need to make it clearer what this stuff does. Great. I want it to look more designed. This is a direct quote. So again, what does it mean? I, I don't know, but uh, a more useful way, my translation of that sentence would be, I realized that when I originally asked for a simple minimalist design, I had something else in mind. Please feel free to add more visual interest. Okay, so there was a misunderstanding. It happens. Uh, but now we got a green light to add a little more interest to design, which is always cool. And the last one, 
please change the menu bar background to blue. So this one is too specific to the point of telling us what to do. Uh, this is not what we want. So a more useful feedback would be, I think the menu bar is visible enough and that people might miss it. Can you propose a different solution? Well, yes, we can, because that's what we do. We'll find something else that works. Maybe it won't be blue, maybe it will be something different. But again, the point here is that this is a legitimate problem that someone else pointed out, and that feedback is useful because it points us in the right direction. Okay, uh, when the client sees these examples, they will have a better idea what kind of feedback is appropriate. And this also is for you project managers. If you're the one critiquing the design, that's also, these guidelines apply to you as well. Now, when the designer is receiving feedback, uh, here are just a few pointers to keep in mind. Of course, listen, listen to what other people are saying and also listen to what they're not saying. Uh, because people, sometimes they either, maybe they shy away from saying what they really mean because they're afraid they're gonna hurt our feelings or maybe they just don't know how to express themselves because they're not used to having these conversations. Uh, designers and project managers are more experienced in these conversations, so you can pay attention uh, to maybe the themes that happen with each client, like some things that uh, people repeat, and you can uh, start deciphering what they really mean when they say things like that, like it's too simple or I don't know, I want to make it pop. Uh, next thing, if you don't know what they, what they mean, ask for clarification. Like, don't be satisfied with a vague answer or with an answer you don't really understand and hope that you'll figure it out later. Like, just ask. And you can ask more specific questions and you can also ask more open-ended questions. Um, the famous designer, Louise Feely, she has a question she asked her clients when they're resistant to changing their old logo to a new logo. And she asked them, what are you afraid of? And it's like a mind-blowing question. All sorts of discoveries happen when she asks them that question. So be creative with asking more questions. Can you sense a theme here? It's all about questions. Okay, if you receive unfavorable feedback, don't argue, don't get defensive, don't make it about you. Of course, I think it's too much to ask of designers to be completely emotionally detached from our work. I'm not sure that's even possible or that it's useful, but if you're having feelings, just process them on your own and don't vomit them all over other people because that's not professional. It's okay to have feelings. Just you know, go cry in a bathroom and then come back and then resume <laughs> the conversation. Yeah. It's okay to cry. Uh, if you're absolutely certain that you're right, try to find data and examples that back it up. Because just saying, I know I'm right, is not going to work. People don't listen to that. Uh, when you have to explain something in order for people to understand why you had to change something on, or why something can't be different than the way you did it, Try to use plain language. Uh, Non-designers don't usually know what kerning and tracking and leading means. Maybe not even all designers know what that means, which is unfortunate. So try to use simpler terms, even if they're not as precise. So you can say the space between the letters or something like, or the space between the lines or however you want to describe it if you're trying to explain some tricky design term. And there are some clients that are going to ask you a million questions, and sometimes it can get annoying and drive you crazy, but try to appreciate those, those clients because they just show that they care about the project a lot and they want to understand what you're doing and what you're trying to achieve. Uh, so if you get a client who asks you many questions, just try to be patient and answer them, and they will respect you all the more for that. And of course, this gives the freedom to everyone who is not a designer to just land millions of questions on designers so they need to kind of explain their thought process. Sometimes in that questioning, um, I think it's called Socratic questioning, a technique where you try to discover uh, things you didn't know just by asking a question that you, know, you don't yet know the answer to. 
So project managers, feel free to ask questions. And you know, designers just need to learn how to live with that. Uh, teach clients, not just clients, so teach project managers, teach developers, teach your boss, teach everyone you can who is willing to listen about design. And then these people will come to your side. You know, you learn that, you know, as you're working closely with someone that they'll try to, they'll pick up your vocabulary, they'll be able to point things out, you know, and it's really amazing when you see how, oh, you're becoming a designer, that's so cute. Yeah, so. And if you're having a conversation in person, make sure to write everything down. So whoever is the designated note taker should just take everything you agreed on, type it, send it to the client, and then the client needs to approve that because sometimes people forget what they said and it's really frustrating when you can't prove that. It happened to me millions of times. So just get everything in writing, everything you possibly can get in writing. Okay, I try to make it short, so that's it from me. Uh, to recap, like, how do you get better feedback? First of all, you collect all the possible information you can in advance, so there's no surprises mid-project. Second, you improve your proposal presentations so that everyone, the client, and everyone on the team understands what you did and why you did it. And, of course, Third one, teach clients how to give useful feedback because that's not their job, that's the designer's job. Okay, so that was all for me. Thank you very much. If you want to download the presentation, you can find it at bit.ly slash design speak. And um, if we don't get to all the questions in the panel, be, feel free to send me an email and I'll be happy to, to answer. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Uh, we're going to have a panel now, so you can harass Nella. And, uh, who are our panel members? Please join me. Grab a seat. So you have to sit there. Okay. Yes, you have to sit up here. That's how the panels work. <laughs> who are you people? Just a second. Wait. <laughs> okay, now, who are you people? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lucian. Um, can, can you pull your chair forward just a little bit? Oh, for you to see? Yeah, then I can stare, stare you down. No problem. I'm not a short. Um, I'm a designer. Uh, I do a lot of uh, freelance work. Uh, I also, uh, in the last uh, two years, I've been working a lot in remote teams, uh, organizing a really big uh, conference for in Europe. And this year I'm uh, leading the design team there, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, so what, what's the name of the conference? Uh, WordCamp Europe. What is it? WordCamp Europe. Word, Word yeah, Europe. it's a, a conference For dedicated WordPress. to WordPress. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I do all, all sorts of stuff, but uh, mostly design and uh, front end that's connected to the design uh, in form of HTML and CSS. I guess that's it. For cool. The, that was way too long. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> and, uh, for the next. Okay, I'll take advice. Um, my name is Mario. I'm a digital designer here at the Gordian. Uh, not much to say about that. I specialize in, uh, you know, uh, interaction design and uh, a little bit on, on UX design. And basically, uh, that grew into a new, you know, like service. So basically, we take a lot of responsibility right now. So basically, you know. This is what I try to do in this company, you know, make a dent in the world and make the world a better place, if you will. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. I don't believe any of that. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, you'll see. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, hello. Uh, my name is Dora. I work in Precoder. Uh, Bye, Precoder. <laughs> Turn your camera sideways. Yeah. Um, You're doing it wrong. So I'm actually, uh, how everyone likes to call it now, a UX UI designer. And since recently I've become a team leader of a development team. So this has been a really interesting kind of shift in my career. Um, and uh, uh, that's it. <laughs> I'll keep it really Thank short. Thank you. I yeah. appreciate that. Thanks. And we already know Nella. Yeah, so. I don't know. Uh, okay, so who has questions about what we just learned? 
just going to keep staring at you until someone raises their hand. I like, thought you should prepare questions. You can. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> questions. Okay. You're a project manager. I know, it's tough though. What do you I mean? already knew all this stuff. So. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's say you're working with PMs. Um, what is something that I can do on your behalf to make your job easier? Like I noticed that the in your in your first Venn diagram thing that the the designer wasn't going and doing anyone else's work. I noticed that mm -hmm. they were shrinking. So how do I how do I make sure my designer isn't shrinking? How can I avoid that? Um. Well, it's typical for designers to shrink, especially if they're less experienced, because they don't know that uh, communicating with other people is also part of their job. So we, when we start in this, I don't know if that's everyone's experience, but it was mine. When I started off, I thought my job was to just draw things, and that was it, and code sometimes, but not talk to people. I was very sheltered in my earlier jobs, uh, and so my project managers were doing all the client communication. So just make sure to bring your designers along, and if they are kind of, you notice them shrinking, you know, hey, what do you think about this? Uh, is there anything you want to ask? Just, just poking them a bit and just making them feel that they are capable of doing that. I think self-confidence is a big problem for everyone, and especially uh, people are like, no, I like sitting in front of the computer. I like not talking to people. I, I like just designing things. But you have to kind of challenge this assumption that designers are just supposed to be sitting in front of the computer all the time. They really should be talking to other people, and clients especially. So just maybe, you know, uh, sometimes kicking them out of their nest and, and letting them flail is a loving way to make them expand. So I will force all my my entire introverted team to talk to people. <laughs> what do you guys do? You agree? Um, sure. Gets it holding yeah, up to your face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do agree, but in my experience, uh, the designers in the firm that I work are actually quite loud. So, <laughs> <laughs> so this is. <laughs> I think this is great for the project managers, but uh, I think that maybe they get overwhelmed sometimes by all the things that we try to kind of say to them and try to kind of get to the clients. And uh, my experience has been kind of hard because uh, we have been taught as designers that the client will be someone who we'll be talking to, and then project managers actually kind of put a block on this, which isn't necessarily bad because you kind of take all the bad stuff on yourself and then give it to us in a really good manner. <laughs> uh, but other than that, yeah, I think it's kind of just like what Nell said, communication, and just to, to keep it on uh, on both territories like the same, so. Well, uh, my actual opinion is that, I mean, we should try to educate our project managers to, you know, understand the designer's perspective. Uh, so we have to introduce into our design lingo the problems we face and uh, the problems we try to solve. So they are better better equipped to filter out the unnecessary feedback, or if you can put it more um, honestly, uh, not so useful feedback. So they can you know know how to you know recognize the unspecific feedback. And in that terms, uh, we as designers. Uh, we can treat our project managers a little bit like clients there because uh, if you're working someone with less experienced project managers, uh, they are kind of you know they need to have some kind of introduction to that theme too because you know you have to you know you have to realize that uh, our design we designers like to you know like to keep our cocoons into our own little world so we have to reach out talk to people and that also includes the project managers so they can defend your decisions when you might not be able to you know because you have to focus on your design work and you will be talking with the clients that's that's unavoidable and i fully fully encourage that but uh, most of the time uh, you might want to focus on your work as a designer and let the project manager do, do his job or her job and basically manage the time uh, to give you the necessary, you know, the assets or pictures or whatnot. And uh, you can uh, uh, focus on making design and uh, argumenting <laughs> what are the distinctions behind the design is, are. So, yeah. <coughs> I'd say that we often talk about uh, how designers should be good communicators, and the truth is that they are not always. That's not always the case. 
Uh, I think that uh, it goes both ways. Uh, project managers could also ask, especially experienced designers, uh, uh, why do you do this the way you did? Or what do you think about this? Or what's the reasoning behind it? Because uh, often designers, uh, they take something for granted because it's logical to them because they are in this job all the time. For example, some, usually the clients ask, like, or, or even project managers, isn't this page going to be too long? Although you have like research, uh, that backs it up that it's okay uh, length for the page. Uh, and sometimes just by project managers asking the questions, like why do you make these decisions, will actually uh, kick the designer into a thinking mode and then he might uh, further down the road uh, maybe provide better uh, guidelines to explaining uh, their design. I think that might be helpful. Any questions? Kristen? So, since you so, since you all started to like print designers and switch to digital design, I suppose, pretty much. Uh, Vice versa. Yeah. Okay, this is a question for digital design. Do you find uh, that focusing on really user needs and not just aesthetics? help you to prove your point when you talk to clients. So it's not really talking about the colors and sizes of homes and make my logo bigger anymore, but you can actually test the product with actual designer and say, okay, users like it. So it's not important anymore that the designer is happy or the CEO is happy. Because if you can prove to him that the clients really, his clients really like it, it's, it adds leverage to your point. And it's also a good real sanity check for yourself. Well, I can just give a real short answer. Uh, I think that designers should be aware of usability problems and accessibility problems. So uh, if a designer uh, uh, didn't read like um, uh, Don't Make Me Tick but by Steve Crook, then go do that immediately. Because these kind of books actually help you think about the user. And even if that designer, if, for example, you're working for the government or some sort of agency that you have to uh, take into consideration, like AAA accessibility rating, you can still choose the colors and make adjustments. You just have to keep that rating in mind. So you have flexibility, but uh, you have to think about that as well. Yeah, if I may. Um, sorry. So um, I think it's very important to define the goals for each project. And this will go a long way to defending your design if you're you know, uh, in front of a client and a uh, client sh starts to drill you and you don't know what to think. You can always refer to the goals. That also means that you have to be aware of those goals at all times while you're designing. So it's very simple question, what, what purpose does your design serve and what goal do you try to achieve? And if client asks something that is purely subjective, you can always defend it with the goals. Of course, there's uh, also, I mean, there, there could be multiple correct solutions to the certain design challenge, and that's perfectly okay. And uh, that's, you know, that's how things goes. I mean, a lot of designers will uh, try to say uh, to, you know, um, solve the problem in a different way, so that's perfectly okay. But if you fulfilled your goals and you feel that you fulfilled your goals for this project, you filled out the user needs, you considered the target audience, you made all the necessary you know, homework before you started drawing, drawing um, I think that should be pretty you know, bulletproof to define, you know, to defend, yeah. Um, well, yeah, I have to agree which, uh, with, uh, with all of you, of course. Uh, so I, I worked uh, as a graphic designer before in an agency and uh, what I found quite hard was uh, defending my work uh, then because it was really subjective. So the client would say, ah, it's too blue, it's too red, it's too whatever. And it was kind of really hard to, to kind of say, okay, but no, why are you, why are you doing this, <laughs> this design? Uh, I mean, um, it was just like this gut feeling that something was wrong and I just can't, I can't uh, stop it from happening. Uh, so what is cool right now uh, is actually yeah, all this research and user testing and all this kind of information that we can 
help back us up with our ideas and just uh, be that kind of uh, like here here are all of the answers that you need and why I'm doing this here are the numbers here are the users here are the the information people you know just uh, have like a little backup plan when defending your work so I think this is really nice but that takes way too long no <laughs> like that adds so much to the quote it does. there's no way I would allow that to happen. <laughs> I would just like to point out something. When we talk about statistics and research, uh, there was a statistic, I think it was 2015 or 2016, some website put a pop-up pop to sign up for their newsletter and their sign-ups rate, the, what do you call, CTR, uh, rose by 50%. But at the same time, uh, Jake Nielsen did research and pop-ups were the most hated form of ads on the web. So you have some, sometimes you have these stats that, you know, whichever answer you have decided on, you can find a statistic to back it up. So either your signups are going to rise or uh, our users are going to hate us. So which one do you want? So this is where goals. Both. I, just, I want but, both. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's what user testing is for, right? Like you can take your design prototype and put it in front of real users and they will pick for you, right? You guys do that, right? <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. Okay, other questions? Hold on, I have to run out there. Ah, so far away. Hello, to everyone. Uh, so my question is, uh, how would you cope with the problem when there is no um, no opportunity to test on real users. So let's say you're, you're uh, working for a really close niche where actually you cannot access your clients, so you're always like uh, one person or one step from them. So there's always someone in, in the middle, let's say uh, either CEO or CTO or whatever, and you simply cannot test on your designated uh, user group. So how, how would you approach that problem? Would you just test it on anyone, or is there something else in your minds? Thank you. I don't have a lot of experience with that, but I would just test it with anyone if I couldn't reach my target audience, but maybe colleagues will have something better. Um, well, uh, I, would also, I would not actually say test it on anyone. I would try to um, find someone around me who can maybe match the user group as, as much as it can. So I think any kind of feedback, uh, I mean, <laughs> okay, not any kind of feedback, but some kind of feedback uh, should, ha should happen. It, it can be bad, it can be good, but I mean, it kind of gets you thinking. So, uh, but this is generally a huge problem with a bunch of clients. Uh, I think they're kind of secretive maybe even with their users and maybe don't really even want to find out, <laughs> I think, because clients always know the best. So yeah, I would kind of try to find something as close to the, to the target group as possible. Um, yeah, I agree that you should find somebody as close as possible to your target audience. Uh, of course, if you're talking about a specific case where that's simply not possible, you can just test it with people who are um, pretty close or just regular users, average users, if you will. And, uh, you know, because any kind of feedback that is not you can be useful to you. And you can, you know, check those uh, things that are basically, you know, like common sense that kind of elude you in a design process. And uh, one other thing I would like to know that design testing is something that people usually associate with some high profile budgets, uh, projects that have high budgets. You can actually fairly successfully test the design with uh, just five people. And that will cover like 80% of the problems. So it's, it's very cheap guerrilla method you can you know find out uh, some amazing insights. And uh, one other thing I would like to add is that um, this design testing shouldn't stop when project is launched. You can always put uh, some kind of feedback button that will you know you will get the feedback from the real users and to get the insights from that because when you're shipping the product or uh, any kind of digital product, where, where is that, I don't know, a website or the, some kind of application or whatnot, 
it's always a good idea to, you know, if budget allows, to put some kind of feedback on, on there. So yeah, it's there is a way to get the, get that feedback and and add to the lab, a launch of the product. Yeah, I add that uh, if you want to test uh, strictly usability. Uh, then testing with like five random users will uncover like 80%. I, I made it up, that statistic. Uh, but it's yeah. like most of the problems, visibility problems can be found with like testing with five people or even not in, the, in that area of expertise. Uh, if you are testing uh, whether you um, uh, set the goals right, then that's a whole other deal. But sometimes if you don't have anything to test but you have the budget, you can always test your competition. And that will actually provide you with really helpful feedback from them. Because often when we talk about design, we often, clients, I mean, and others, they will say, I want the search to work like on booking.com or Airbnb or whatever. So you can always test like those pages, like pay someone or, or buy them copy or something. Yeah. And that might also like work out. Yeah. Good advice, thanks. Um, any other questions from the audience? It's my turn. Um, okay, so if I want to uh, have a more structured feedback session, what's one thing I can do as like a PM to help you uh, interface with the clients? What what can I what can I do to get you the feedback that you need? Mm, don't use Jira, please. <laughs> why not? Why no, not? Just kidding. Why not? Uh, I heard it. It sucks, but I it's I, not bad. I don't it's not use bad. it. Uh, okay, we have some feedback from the audience. Uh, so, for me personally, it helps that I know what each question or, or comment is referring to. So, if, if we are talking about like information architecture, then I, I'd love for that information to be grouped. If you're talking about like visual styles, uh, like we have to spice things up, then I'd love that those things to be separated. So, for me, it helps to have like separate points, like talking points. And that way, even if we don't have time to cover all of them, like what color blue should be in the menu, uh, then we can just like go from top priority. Like, is the navigation covering all the important pages or whatever? And then we can uh, like get down to uh, other details. So I should tag and prioritize my Jira tickets? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, but don't just place high priority on all of them because that doesn't work usually. Well, uh, this method applies to you know discovery phase and uh, also to getting the feedback. Uh, so basically, it depends on the designer style of how to structure feedback that will be useful to the designer. I mean, I, I, do, I believe that there shouldn't be a method that is set in stone. So whatever works for you should be just fine. Um, but basically, what we're doing, what, what, what we like to do is to you know. Uh, set up a meeting face to face. I think that's very uh, I mean, cool thing uh, to do because, uh, of course, you can get some kind of agenda up front, you know, so you can get the feedback. You know, you can prepare for the to, for the possible questions. But uh, yeah, I mean, face to face meetings I think work best, and you make sure you write everything down. The other method is to you know help hold a workshop. Basically, it's just a fancy meeting. But it's a more in a structured way when you have a detailed, defined agenda, which basically touch the every each aspect of the project. And basically, this is something more suitable for some more complex projects like I don't know CRM tools or e-learning systems or whatnot. But uh, I think those methods are just tools. You know, you can use whatever you want as long as you get uh, clean, clear information up front and uh, next steps, you know, if they are defined, you can you know, proceed. Um, so, most of the clients that we actually work now uh, with now are uh, not from Croatia, so these meetings are kind of really hard to come by and kind of expensive to organize. So most of the communication is uh, through, I don't know, mail, Slack, and all these kind of uh, other types of communication. So I think the most important thing is information. In these cases, uh, the worst thing that can happen is like, okay, the client said, and then provide one, uh, one sentence. 
and kind of expect from us to know what to do next. And then we kind of ask for more information, and then this takes a while while the client re replies. And I think this this is kind of the biggest problem, just kind of get all the information before coming to the designer, or as much as possible. Or include the designer. Or include, yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, so what, you, what they said, absolutely. <laughs> uh, but also, like, okay, so I don't know if you guys, like, you like to use Jira, what the designers use. I mean, do you have any kind of a central hub where you talk to everyone on the team? I don't know, I love Trello, Trello is wonderful. So I like to have all my feedback there in one place. Like, please don't just, you know, put part of feedback here, part of feedback here, one in the email, one in the ticket, and then it's just so, too much time just to, you know, have all those, then I kind of copy paste them in Notepad to have them in one place so I can check them off. And just very frustrating, so just uh, make sure that the clients are using whatever method of communication uh, you have agreed beforehand, that it doesn't slip and go, you know, they said something over the phone and then they wrote something over the email and then you have to check the timestamps, did they say this before that? Does this sentence negate the previous one? You know, it's just streamlining it all into just one form, even if it's a Word document or, or Google Doc, whatever, just please put it in one place. Yeah, I mean, I know you project managers love that too, I'm just reinforcing that, like, please, just one, one source of information. Don't make me join Slack. I don't want to go to Slack. Like, I hate Slack. <laughs> what I got out of that was, I shouldn't have to like use the comments on whatever designer tool you're using. So uh, me, uh, that could work. I actually uh, the comments in the in the Adobe Reader or Acrobat. I mean, you know, put that kind of post it on it and write, why not if that works? But you have to agree with it. Like you have to come to like joint decision. Like, okay, what we're gonna use? We can use PowerPoint. My boss, ex boss, love to use PowerPoint. Don't ask. Okay, lightning round. User personas, good or bad? Uh, good. It's lightning. Good, yeah. Of course. Yeah, if you put some time into it, if you're just like making them up, then no good. Okay. User personas, do you use them on every project? No. <laughs> no. No. Uh, no. <laughs> Follow up question. User personas. What can I do to get you to use them on every project? Uh, remind me. Okay, that's good. Uh, provide information for making these personas. What does that mean? Clarify, please. I mean, uh, we need information when we do personas. We can't just, I'm, I mean, information from the client, yeah. yeah, so. You can include it in standard process, so you can apply it to the every project. Yeah, what Dora said, just. Yeah. Just do it. <laughs> okay. Question in the back. Yeah, you have to meet me halfway. Come on. <laughs> um, so there was a lot of talk about feedback and everything. Uh, I'm interested how do designers do, now this is a broad question, but how do you do estimates? How do you stick to them? I just build hourly. Usually. Uh, no, uh, kidding aside, uh, I try to be uh, uh, really frank with clients, uh, and of course I provide some sort of estimate, but I also uh, tie those estimates with features that we're working on. Uh, so that way, when I'm working, like if it's a really complex page that has like a, I don't know, really complex flow, like a checkout or, or a booking or something, then I just try to focus on the bare minimum that would get the project done, and I always communicate to the clients how much far I am with the time spent in. So that way. Uh, I make sure that I don't run out of budget because uh, before we actually uh, create the most important stuff first. Uh, that's at least my experience. Yeah, you have to know the all the requirements up front or as precise as possible. You should know you work here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we uh, well basically almost no necessary info. Sometimes that shouldn't be uh, much of the problem. Sometimes you get a lot of discoveries along the way, but uh, we try to break it down, you know, break it down into certain, certain chunks and to break it down as precise as possible, you have to be aware how much time you're spending on your uh, previous projects 
uh, time checking tools are especially useful for that. So if you have some unforeseen consequences for I don't know change requests or something like that, you should count that in. So also there's a good uh, idea to include communication with the client, some kind of assessment if a client is you know very uh, uh, agreeable, you know that can sometimes can be a factor. Uh, but basically, if you break it down, provided you know the necessary requirements, it, it will get you pretty far in terms of, you know. And as far as sticking it with, uh, with the deadlines, you should be, you know, on a daily basis aware roughly how much work have you done and how much budget have you spent. Those numbers should align in percentage, okay? Um. Okay, so we actually uh, estimate in ranges, which is kind of nice, so we don't uh, always uh, give a precise number. I mean, these ranges actually work really well because if the range is really large, that means that you're not really sure what, what you're going to do and what is happening in the project. And this can be communicated with the client also. So you could say, okay, you haven't provided enough information, so my estimate range is huge because we have so many risk factors that I just can't, cannot give you a good estimate. And this kind of makes them also think about, you know, okay, I think I have to think about this project, I have to kind of restructure this. And I would also say just uh, breaking it down into tiny chunks is the best, best thing ever. <laughs> just kind of uh, put it all down, paper, everything, every feature, every screen, whatever, just put it down and kind of get to the, the smallest kind of molecule of the project and then give the estimate. And it's probably much more precise than doing the whole thing globally. Yeah, yeah what uh, they said about tracking, I have like four years of projects just by the minute every task that I ever did and then I took it into a spreadsheet and I calculated everything and now I have averages for every kind of type of project that I did in the past which is really nerdy but it's very helpful because that made me realize that client communication can take up anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of the entire project which is crazy like I never knew that before I had the number uh, so just having that history really helps you how to plan in advance and uh, one helpful thing is that most of my projects nowadays are really similar in, in kind of scope. So that made me much better at uh, projecting what something will take. And also I like to uh, anticipate how much something will take by the week. So not in days, but like, I don't know, four to six weeks. And so I have like two weeks leeway and I have five days in order to make it work somehow. I don't have to do it by Wednesday, I can do it like Friday midnight. Like, so well, making it work, like each phase of the project takes, I don't know, one or two weeks. And uh, then each phase corresponds to this, like a little bigger time frame. And then most of the time recently I've been uh, finishing projects ahead of time, which is completely new and mind-blowing, since I've started doing that. So projecting in weeks, and each phase takes a minimum of one week. Like there's no such a phase that lasts only two days. Like no, it's a week or two weeks or three weeks, not not smaller increments. And then it kind of averages out as you go. From the PM perspective, I'll say three point estimates. Um, and if you missed the talk, I think it was November. We had Burko come from Three Quarter, and he gave us away, gave us all of his uh, secrets for how to estimate well. So you should. We have go, it on YouTube. Yeah, we have it on YouTube, so go watch that. <laughs> um, and pro tip, you mentioned uh, do it in weeks. Make sure your sprints end on a Monday, not a Friday, because then the worst case scenario, you can just work the whole weekend, and then it, it'll be done. So, Okay, one more lightning round, and then we'll have a, one final question. So, uh, Design sprints, good or bad? Um, not using them. Okay. Um, also, did not have a chance to work uh, on design sprints, but I would say good. Okay. Not using it in a traditional sense, but clear set goals in a you know in a time frame, they're they're good. Uh, I have uh, done design sprints in the past. I really love them. Uh, they help you connect with the client better and with the whole team who is going to actually work and collaborate on the project. So thumbs yeah. up for cool. design sprints. Okay, and last question. Hi everyone. So how can we as project managers can help you uh, cope with the long-term projects, project with uh, a lot of changes 
in terms of your motivation, uh, uh, productivity and uh, patience? Uh, I don't uh, work usually like on a really long project if you're talking about like six months and more. Well, uh, we think with lots of changes. Big with lots of changes. Okay, uh, well it helps, uh, sprints in general help me because then I know that we are focusing on only one thing at a time or two or three things, it doesn't matter. And that way I know that I have always a feeling of progression. I always complete something, like each week I can deliver something, I can, I can do something. So even if, if there are like, a, like dozens of changes, I would love to, for you to group them and then maybe give it to me like one group at a time. So if we are like, uh, I don't know, uh, improving the homepage or something, then let's focus on that at the moment. And then after we've done that, then we can focus on something else. At least that works for me. But if it's like a client from hell, then I'm not sure like, that I would want to work on that project. I mean, the milestones that on, well, you have, when you have a long project and, uh, and you have some milestones defined for the, each part of the project, that also helps. I mean, I don't believe that it's strictly project manager's job to manage feelings of the designer. Designers should learn that. So they have, they have to harden up because I don't I don't like to be treated like uh, I don't know under the golden bell. If I don't know is that is that's the correct term, but um, because if you do that, you're robbing us the ability to know harden up and. Uh, I had uh, I had a similar experience with a long project, you, you know, but and they can be pretty challenging. A uh, thing that can help us, you can help. Um, you mean you can you know try to you know introduce some other tasks that are not, not so monotonous for the for the designer. So if we I don't know if you're working with spreadsheets and scripts, if because that happens because that involves the content for the large project. I think that for me personally, I like to draw something from time to time, not to just spend weeks just planning. Things. Draw one thousand buttons. Yeah, <laughs> one thousand buttons. Yeah, or just duplicate them. That's also that also sorry. Yeah, um, but yeah, you. I think the mixing should happen in a project, but also I believe that it's a designer's responsibility to, to introduce something you know different in their life while doing that project because I don't know uh, trying to do some side projects if you're a designer so not not much you can do as a project manager you have to you know let them you know let them let it go let them let it go a little bit so yeah um, I would also have to agree that kind of uh, the feeling that like things are getting done is kind of the thing that uh, pushes us to continue doing things uh, and probably the worst thing is uh, just uh, skipping around a bunch of tasks uh, this is like the worst thing that can happen like uh, like in one day so you don't uh, say okay you have like 50 tasks just do all of them at once but just kind of have the structure uh, to kind of take on the project and uh, maybe try to keep the client from coming back to things that were already done uh, before the other things on the checklist are not done yet, so yeah, that's it. But we have to get their feedback, right? <laughs> yeah, but just kind of keep the feedback uh, in in a normal kind of state. Just not ask them. Just give it, give all the feedback, all the time feedback. <laughs> yes, yeah, so some last. They already said like ninety nine percent of what I wanted to say. Thanks a lot. Uh, but so here's the point. Like, uh, if the client has some feedback that would get you to go back a milestone, then just say, you know what, we'll do this in version two, let us just finish this project and we'll get to that later. Just try not to um, let a client slide back, you know, like what we were working on two months ago, because that's just um, horrible. And I personally dislike working on super long projects, which is why I'm not working on them. Yay. Uh, but honestly, this is what's just really frustrating when you finally complete something and then they make you go back and like paint over the road all over again. Like, come on, let's not do that. We already did this. So just save it for version two. Like, okay, we'll do that next year. Yeah, next year. Yeah. <laughs> ship, ship early, ship often. Then you can actually see your results. I think that's 
for me at least, the, the most important thing. So uh, thanks to our panel for joining us. Uh, everyone, please put your hands in the air. I'm serious. Come on. Yeah, you, you, yeah, you guys can too. You folks can too. Okay, uh, leave your hand up if you're hiring uh, project or product managers for your company. No one, okay? Put your hands up again. Oh, there's one person in the back, so if you want a new job, talk to that person. And put your hands up again, please, since we have so many designers here. Uh, please uh, leave your hand up if you are hire if your company or you are hiring designers or UX or UI people. So. If you want a new job, there's some people over there. So there you go. Uh, we have lots of treats for you. Thank you for joining us. As a reminder, we record all of these talks and panels, and we put them on YouTube about a month later, sometimes two months later. So if you want to have the most up-to-date information, please join us next month. It's always the second Wednesday of the month. See you next time. Thanks.